Hi, my name is Larry Butler. I work here at the EHCC as a volunteer and I collect textiles. And I'd love to show you some of my pieces and talk a little bit about how textile patterns are made. And maybe it'll interest you in making some new patterns. Some things are really simple like this. This is a little napkin from Japan where it's a bright, bold pattern of red and white and it's simply printed. And that's one way you can make a pattern. Or you could do that, of course, with paint. You could do it with a resist. Let me show you some of the more exotic techniques that you can try too. Let's go to Africa. Here are some of my African textiles. One way you can make patterns is to weave them on a loom. Here's a piece from Ghana, from West Africa, where not only are the stripes woven, but so are the checkerboards. They're woven right into the loom by the men who make Ghana textiles. And it's interesting, some parts of the world men weave, most parts of the world women weave. And that's part of the story of textiles. This is a very complicated kind of weaving. This is the famous kente cloth from Ghana. And each one of these strips was woven individually and then sewn together to make this wonderful pattern. So the pattern is woven and in each case, the pattern means something. Very often patterns are not just abstract, they're meaningful. And so they often illustrate a proverb about being a good king or being a good mother and they'll be woven in. So this again is men's weaving, kente cloth. Here's another way of making pattern. I've got a very long piece here, that's only about a third of it, from the Kuba people of Central Africa, nowadays uh, Angola and Congo. And here's another piece of Kuba. What they've done is what we call applique. They've sewn pieces of cloth onto another cloth to make bright, bold patterns. The dyes are very natural, and a lot of the pieces in my collection, that's true. If you see something in red and black and buff, it's probably natural vegetable dyes. In fact, the fiber that they use is also interesting. It's palm tree fiber, fiber raffia. So they make these big, bold patterns. And there's stories about people driving trucks and making tire tracks on the ground and local weavers coming out and saying, hey, let's study that pattern. Let's see if we can reproduce it. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I like it. This is an African pattern from Nigeria. And in this case, this is resist dyed. Um, they used wax or a similar material and blocked out parts of it and then dyed it with indigo. The black is several dyings of indigo. This is probably one dyeing of indigo and it leaves a nice bright pattern. And also part of the fun of resist dyeing is it gets crinkly. You can see the crinkles in here. And the crinkles are where the dye has broken through the wax. And it gives it a little bit more life. Let's go up to Northwest Africa, Morocco. I just got this piece recently. This is a face of a bag, some sort of all-purpose bag for your household or your camel. Um, this is women's work. This is Berber women and it's very, very complicated. They wove this red strip, that's just wool, and then while the thing is still on the loom, this isn't embroidery, it's not printing, they're actually weaving this complicated diagonal pattern into the textile. And then just for fun, they added sprinkles, little silver things, which means it was probably at a wedding or some other celebration. So this is very complicated and this is this kind of weaving we think has been done by the Berber women for maybe 3,000 years. Oh, let's move over to Indonesia in Southeast Asia. Another of the world's oldest, oldest traditions. On the out islands, they're using that black, red, and buff of the natural dyes, and they make these weavings with animals. You see the animals down at the bottom? And if I flip it, you'll see animals at the top. <laughs> and they often have people too. So they're using figures, not just geometry, not just stripes, but actually weaving figures of animals and plants and sometimes people into the drawing. This is, by the way, this is a kind of textile called ikat. And ikat, maybe it's easiest to see on this one, This is from Thailand. In ikat, 
you actually dye the pattern before you weave the cloth. You stretch out either the warp or the weft and you dye the pattern and then weave it and that's why the pattern is all ziggy zaggy. It's all very uneven and that makes the beauty. And if you fall in love with ecot, you will fall in love hard because we all love ecot. <laughs> I have a lot of it and it can look all different ways. This is a piece from Western China on the Silk Road. And again, they dyed the pattern with that fork <laughs> before they actually wove it. So they dye the pattern on the long warps and then they weave the blue weft, which is the short sideways threads. And again, it makes a ziggy zaggy wonderful pattern. It's very hard to do. The harvest of all the Here's a piece from Bali, Indonesia today. It's continuous, look at that. It's, there's no beginning or end. It's again that black, red, and buff that so much natural dye is. The colors are significant and they often are in patterns. Black is death, red is blood, white is life or purity. And so many, many world cultures use these three plus they're easy to make with dyes. But in this case, it's ikat both directions, which means both the warp, this is the warp, and the weft going across. They were both dyed with a pattern before weaving. You can actually see that here. In these warp threads, you can see that there's some dyeing of a pattern where they wrapped the warps with thread and then dyed them black and left white marks in them. This is very special, very ritual. Um, I only own it because you can only use it once and then it's discarded and they sell it to tourists, like me. <laughs> this is a crazy ikat. This is a Chinese pattern from Indonesia. I think it's a very beautiful pattern. Here's, maybe this is better. Where, I don't know how close you can come, but every single stripe in there, do you see that looks like grain of wood? Every one of those is a separate dye process. This is amazing. Now this is actually not an ikat, this is another technique. This is called batik. Batik is when you use wax and you draw. And you, the wax blocks out the cloth and anything that's not wax dies. So this is about eight to 12 stages of dyeing with wax to make that pattern. This is ikat. This is from Java in Indonesia. And it's a pattern, it's a royal pattern. Again, patterns aren't always meaningless. This is a pattern famous for being worn by royalty. They call it the bent knife. And it zigs and it zags. It's in these muted browns and indigo colors, indigo dyes. And to show you how hard this is, here's an e-cut I tried to make. Oh dear. <laughs> what I did is I made my pattern of white with wax, with a little wax pen. Hot wax comes out. I drew the pattern. It's horrible. And then they dyed it in blue dye. And then they boiled it to wash the wax off. And what's left is this mess. <laughs> so it's not easy to do. We learned humility. Ah, what should we look at? Let's go to Japan. And here's some other techniques I haven't talked about. Now one very simple way to make a nice pattern is to print it. This is a beautiful pattern. This is something I got at Himeji Castle, a very famous castle in Japan. And they simply block print these, which makes it very bold and handsome. And it's cheap and it's easy. And for years and years, hundreds and thousands of years, people have made cheap pattern textiles simply by printing them. And they're very satisfying. At the other end, oh my goodness. This is Japanese. And here, this is part of a woman's kimono, <laughs> thank you. This is the obi that goes around the waist. And this gorgeous, bold, bold pattern has all been woven on the loom into the cloth. The cloth is very heavy. And you can see that even the threads they wove with have been dyed in some kind of a, an ikat style. So one thing that textile is very good at is bold. If you want bold patterns, it doesn't get bolder. On the other hand, one thing textile is good at is subtle. 
This is one of my favorite pieces. This is from Cambodia, and it's made out of ikat, that technique where you dye the pattern before you weave it, and it's so subtle, you almost don't see the pattern. But when you do, you're astonished because it's very, very fine and beautiful. So with textiles, you can go bold, you can go subtle. Here's another couple of appliques. Again, if you like bold patterns, this one's from Korea. It's modern. It's made out of a heavy plant fiber. I think it's linen. And the artist has simply done a very simple but striking and handsome job of alternating squares of red, and, oh, sorry, yellow and green on blue. I use it in my house as a table runner. And I have a similar one from Vietnam. And this one, again, it's applique, which means the pattern is sewn on in pieces. Again, it's a very simple geometric pattern, but this is silk. And the fineness of the silk and the boldness of the pattern together, I think, make it a really striking piece. Finally, one more technique, embroidery. Again, a lot of this comes with, oh, gender history. In Turkey, this is what a young woman would spend her young womanhood practicing back in the Ottoman Turkish times. This is 19th century. She would practice her embroidery because it's part of what makes her marriageable. And this would be a big part of her marriage treasure. And there would be family heirlooms, so this is a beautiful set of floral patterns woven into an all-purpose towel. It's not really meant to be used for anything. It's meant to decorate your house. So if you're having a huge celebration, you would bring out all of these from your family trunk and you'd hang them all over the house to show off how good your daughter was at embroidery. The floral patterns are popular for embroidery. Here's one last one. Again, this is from Turkey. This is modern, but it's in an Ottoman technique. And again, it's a beautiful, very bold, symmetrical floral pattern. It's not real naturalistic, but then they didn't want that. They wanted it bold. And they've embroidered the whole thing onto a silk background. And again, I think it's very, very handsome. So those are a few of my treasures. I hope you enjoyed our little look at them. And maybe it'll give you some ideas for your own work. I'm also going to put in an ad. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on Indonesian textiles this month in March, March 15th, that's Monday at 12 noon, and it'll be a little historical and geographic survey of Indonesian textiles. So if you liked that pile over there, I've got lots more to talk about. Thanks again for your attention. Hope you enjoy your, your textile work.